another Mama Presents. You know, the Maui Arts and Music Association has taken and gone on hiatus, and today we're going to be called, what you know us through election season, we're one-on-one, -on -one, up close and personal with different people that are choosing to put their hat into the political ring and represent us here in Maui County. Today I have a great guest. In fact, a guest that I have seen grow. The last time I saw Lance Collins, welcome Lance, Glad to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Lance was, um, I don't know if you were running. You were running for something. I was running for Board of Education in 1998. 1998. So where are we now? 2004. Six years ago. Yeah, six years ago. Well, this little guy has grown into a big guy. <laughs> and uh, Lance is now running for Maui County Council. And now I'm sure that we're going to discover what race he's running in. But because all of Maui County votes for all the representatives, I want to first tell you that if you like Lance Collins, you can vote for him wherever you live in Maui County, whether it be Maui, Molokai, Lanai, whether you've seen him up close and personal, in person or not, we're here to be able to give you an opportunity to meet Lance Collins. Lance, pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's actually very funny because when I ran for Board of Education, no, that didn't seem to be a problem. But this time, a few people have asked me, are you even old enough to vote? Oh, good. I'd, so I, I, I take it as a compliment because <laughs> everyone's telling me to take it as a compliment. But I'm, uh, I'm 24. I'm 24, yeah. So you have been what they call a young and vital part of our community. Before you were able to vote, you were interested. Absolutely. I, I've you know, started getting involved with the uh, county council when I was 15. Well, actually, when I was 14, but then I actually really started, you know, doing lots of work, lots of research, spending a lot of time talking with different council members and being at council meetings when I was 15, but I, I actually started when I was 14. So you are so. a heavily experienced young man. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I am. I, I graduated from uh, high school when I was 15. Wow. And uh, I went to MCC, and I became the student body president there. Um, but I still continue doing stuff with the council. And then uh, just before I finished at MCC, they appointed me to the subcommittee to update the Maui County Code. And uh, that was definitely an experience. We had three people running for mayor <laughs> on that committee. So it, for something that seems so, you know, Manini and, you know, like just revising county ordinances, it became, you know, like every life and death issue of the county ended up coming before the subcommittee. And we were fortunate to get some good work done. Didn't get to finish everything, but... Uh, we did that, and then uh, about a year later, I graduated from uh, UH, um, and uh, then I got my master's degree. <laughs> Are you catching this? This is in six years. This young man has been racing through our education system. Yeah. Plus, he's been vitally involved in politics. I would guess you'd say that you're sort of like a, a poster child for <laughs> um, people in our society who have an interest and pursue it. And that's been wonderful. And you graduated with a master's now in what? At, at 20. Oh, in uh, indigenous politics, political science. Yeah. At 20. Are you <laughs> sick yet? I hope you're sick. <laughs> well, you, you know this. And now you're 20? Now I'm 24, four. and I have a law degree. Yeah. OK. Catch this. So this young man, although I wanted to bring up his age, is a wealth of experience. And that's why you're running for council, I bet. Well, you know, that's uh, a, a big part of it. I think if anybody watches, you know, the council meetings on Akaku regularly, one thing that they notice is that a lot of the county issues involve complex legal problems. And unfortunately, because no one on the council has a background, they have to sort of rely on the county attorneys. And once the county attorney says whatever the county attorney believes, that's the end of it. That's the end of the discussion. And you either agree with the county attorney or you defer the issue. And I think a lot of the problems uh, with council being able to do things has to do with the fact that no one has any kind of, you know, legal training to say, wait a second, I, I think I have a different idea about that. So I'm hoping to bring that. And of course, over the last 10 years, I've, 
you know, I mean, I, I, I don't encourage people to go out and sue. <laughs> I, I think that litigation is the worst possible thing to do. And so for the last 10 years, I've been involved with community organizing and mediation and trying to work through some of the community's problems in non, you know, court kinds of ways. And uh, we've been successful. And of course, sometimes we haven't been successful. But, you know, the, the most important part is building community. And even when we're not successful in what we wanted to achieve, just coming together as a community has been very important. So. What have been some of the issues that are your passion? Well, you know, I mean, as I just said, you know, the, the way the council operates is, is something that I think is a, is a very big issue. And I think that that's something that, that maybe about 75% of the council's problems stem from the fact that the council is not as open as it should. It doesn't engage in democratic policy making. You know, it doesn't involve all of the members of the community. You know, public testimony is sort of, you know, it always seems that the council members sort of already have made up their mind. And the whole point of having public testimony is so that you sort of can get a better understanding of what exactly is the issue. But, you know, only two things are possible when you're not paying to people testifying, paying attention to people testifying. And that is either one, you don't think that they have anything to add to the issue, or two, you don't care. And uh, I think it can't possibly. Uh, be true that when people come to testify, you know what their issue is. And so that, for me, is that's one area. And of course, you know, the county attorney sort of making decisions and not that come up before the council. Generally, in the last two years, nothing has actually been done. Overall, the council historically has created this sort of adversarial win-lose situation in our community where you know, you pit the developers against the people and all this kind of stuff. And it, it doesn't work that way. On, on, on an island, you either all win or you all lose. There's no win or loser thing. It's, and so when someone loses, everyone loses. And I think that the council needs to change the way that it does business and it operates, and I think that that's very, very important. Of course, you know, I mean, that's everyone's like, oh, okay, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. But you know, I mean, there's everyone talks about affordable housing, and that is very important. Our local families need to be able to have their own home, either to rent or to buy, and they have to have somewhere to live. You know, I mean, some people like to live on the beaches, and that's fine. But you know, most of the people that live on beaches aren't doing that because they want to, or you know, we have a lot of kids that are my age and even older who are living at home with their parents because they can't afford anything. I mean, I, I, know, I know some people who are in their late 30s and they're still living at home because they can't afford, and they've been saving and they can't afford you know, a house and they're not one of the lucky 10 that win an affordable housing lottery. So, you know, it, that, that's a major, major issue. And I think that it, it can be resolved if we stick with the community plans, we stick with the general plan, we listen to what the community says, and we develop a long-range, broad-viewed plan and stick with it and follow it and none of this sort of backdoor development or anything like that. I mean, the whole point of the community plan process and the general plan process is the community comes together and says, this is what we want for our community. And you know, in Kihei Makena, the, the Cebu project, for example, that's not, you know, their, their rezone is not in the community plan. And there are thousands of units in that area that are planned to be. So that is an example. It's bring it in through the back door, back door development, and then it, it, it's adding, I mean, there's already thousands of units that are supposed to go there. So when you, you add this one, it's, it's even more. And then, you know, that's, first, that's the big slap in the face for the Kihei McKenna community. But the second slap is that there's going to be no affordable housing in the area. So what it means is that there's going to be more people that are traveling, traveling Pi'ilani Highway or South Kihei Road every morning to go and be maids or whatever in these luxury homes. And that's, you know, that, that doesn't help anybody. And that sort of, sort of totally defeats the community plan process, and it defeats the community as a whole. So like I was asking, what's your favorite issue? I think the favorite issue keeps coming up no matter where I go. <laughs> Affordable housing. The real estate community here, you know, I'm a realtor, mm -hmm. and I'm also a, a mortgage agent. Mm. And I have solutions that we're going to talk about after we're done okay. off camera. But I think it's so interesting that someone here, <coughs> so young, who's aware that in his lifetime, 
just in the last few years. Things have gone out of sight. They have gone to the point where they're unreachable and seemingly unavailable by our local community. A statistic that was shocking to me mm -hmm. was that 90% 90 90%, of yeah. the real estate sales in the last calendar year were to people that do not live on this island. If that doesn't upset you, I don't know what will. Well, it's not just that they don't. It's just not. It's not just that you know outsiders are coming in and moving. That that is happening as well. But I think what's what the ninety percent uh, statistic. What is so shocking is, is that these people don't necessarily. They're not going to be moving here. They're just the house is being built, but they're not really moving. It's either going to turn into a vacation rental, or they're going to live here two months out of the year, or you know that that kind of thing. And so what ends up happening is this. It's <laughs> it's sort of like there are going to be ghost towns, which I know Kana Pauli with the timeshares and other things like that have, have noticed that there's all of these places where they're just ghost towns. And it seems so, so frivolous and so, so hurtful to the community that we have our carpenters building all of these houses that nobody's going to live in, that nobody can afford. And you know? what's interesting about that also is there are support businesses in these areas that go through peaks and valleys, yep. and they're sitting there paying high rents, and they're dying. They're Absolutely. Dying. And I think it's really an amazing thing that uh, we have continued to propagate and build these communities just like Lance is sharing about. You know, um, it's almost larger than a bread box, you know? Well, you know, I think one of the things with the council is that, you know, you, you have to have a long, long-term, broad view of, of where you're going. I mean, you know, and then when you've made mistakes, you just have to say, okay, that's fine, and, and move on from it. And I think what's happened is, is that we're continuing on a failed policy of not looking forward. What would you do on the Cebu McKenna thing? Do you have any feeling for that one? Well, you know, it's a complicated issue because, you know, of all of the hearings and all of the three-ring circuses that went on with it. But, you know, the truth is, is that you know, I, I, I participated in the Kihei McKenna community plan process. I also participated in the upcountry one and uh, a little bit on the West Maui one. And, you know, the, the, and I, I contributed just as it was beginning, the, the Kahului uh, community plan. But, you know, with the Kihei McKenna community plan, we, you know, there's already a vision for McKenna. And it's very clear. And, in fact, the, the Cebu uh, folks are already part of that. They are, but what they want is they now want to sort of change that and they because whatever it's not profitable enough or or this or that but you know they don't it's not really asking the community if you wait four years after the community plan and then decide to make a change and so you know it's a close call but the truth is is that our community needs to be listened to and when we're not listened to we end up with traffic problems with not enough water with no affordable housing because the community plan takes all of that into consideration all of our community planning processes take all of these matters into consideration. And when we don't follow them, we're t what we're saying is we're not taking any of those issues into consideration, and then we end up with major traffic problems or major water shortages. In uh, your experience that you've had, you've been following some of, well, I guess, all of the, uh, the different people on council. You live in Kahului? I do. You lived in Kahului? I have since I was a little boy. So of course, I, before that, I, we lived in Wailuku, and then before that, Kihei. Well, I mean, but, is, uh, yeah. you are I, I've lived most of my in life your, in Kahului. In your seat against um, Joe Pontanella, because yeah. he happens to live in your area. Right. But uh, you have, I'm sure, no specific bone to pick. No, in fact, you know, d uh, Joe and I went to uh, breakfast uh, in July, and we, you know, chatted for about an hour. And no, you know, he's a very nice man, uh, you know, personally. Um, I just think that uh, the council can be benefited more by having someone with legal experience and, uh, you know, who's a uh, hard worker and diligent and sort of has the youthful exuberance that's right. uh, needed to, to make our council efficient and so that we can start focusing on proactive, creative things instead of just being so bogged down in, you know, all of these problems that we end up only being reactive and we and the council can only do things when things turn into major crises. We should be able to see crises 10 years before they happen, not two years after they've already occurred, and that's what's going on right now. I used to say, well, when I was running, I may run again, but so watch out, <laughs> <laughs> um, that if I won, uh, when I was running against um, Linda Lingle and Goro Hakama for mayor, <laughs> I was the Green Party candidate. Yeah. I remember telling Goro that the first thing that I would do would be to hire him 
and Linda to be my two assistants because there are a lot of things that could be done, but there needs to be a new, uh, a new paradigm Absolutely. for how things are observed. And that's kind of what you're saying. That you feel you could be a vital part and historic part where Absolutely. we take a look and use some visioning in the council seats mm -hmm. to be able to create a future plan and stick with it so that yeah. we can live the vision that we have. Well, you know, and, and, and also, you know, I mean, Charmaine Tavares is in her last term. This will be her last term. And when she's done, she's done. And it, it you know, for me and, and uh, you know, our generation, we're, we're now just beginning to, you know, make our inroads into, you know, the community. And I think that it would be very unfortunate if the last two years that Charmaine, uh, you know, were in office, that. Uh, there would be nobody on the council to be able to take her wisdom and, and, her, and her leadership and her understandings and be able to move forward with it. In uh, 97 and 98, when I was on the subcommittee to update the Maui County Code, uh, she was on it. She was actually, her and the county clerk, I think, were the two other non-mayoral non candidates uh, at the time. And, you know, wow. we were the, her and the county clerk and oh, the director of council services, the four of us were the only ones that always showed up to every single meeting and were there from beginning till end. And you know, I, we work well together, and uh, you know, I, I think that she has a lot of wisdom and, and a lot of aloha for our community, and it's something that I definitely would like over the next two years as a council member to be able to, you know, experience and, and be able to be, you know, an apprentice to. And uh, I, I think that that's very important, and that would be very invaluable to the, for the community as a whole to be able to carry on the traditions that Charmaine Tavares has been working for for the last eight years. I'm impressed with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Just thought I'd give you a clue here. <laughs> you know, there, uh, this offer to have television interviews like we're doing was offered to all the people on county council. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are one of the rare people that I'm interviewing this season. Mm -hmm. Even though I did three elections, I kind of feel that um, we become resigned as the public to uh, think that we'll just get little sound bites of who these candidates are. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that so far you've learned a lot about Lance here, just from well, how much he shared. You know, I, I try to show up at, uh, you know, every forum that's that's given and every public event. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to walk the whole county, which is a little bit hard to do. His feet tight, right? <laughs> well, it's more of like my shins, but yeah. I mean, you know, but the thing is, is that I, you know, I want to talk to people, and when I, you know, go, go door to door, I tell people, you know, hi, my name is yep. Lance Collins, I'm running for Maui County Council, and here's some information about me. But this isn't all of the information about me, and there's more information on my website, and of course we have the web, web, web address the there. Address? Let's see it's uh, www.lancedcollins.com, um, and there's more information there, but still, you know, I, I, we've had about... I would say about 200 people over the last four months email us because they felt that there was some issue that they had that wasn't adequately addressed, uh, and they wanted to know where I stood on it. And you know, I, I you know, and so we we email them back and we tell them, and you know, going door to door, we tell people, well, this is you know exactly this is where I stand. And you know, I mean, the truth is is that anybody can take a stand. And I tell them this, you know, anybody can have a position on an issue, but it's a person that actually gets the job done that's important. And that's something that, that, that I can offer, that I can get the job done right the first time. What issues do people bring up to you? Well, the, the most prevalent one uh, in Kahului has been uh, affordable housing. Okay. Um, you know, certain, during certain times, you hit certain groups of people. And uh, you know, during the, the lunch hour and shortly thereafter, you know, mostly it's parents who have adult children living with them. And they, as their children can't afford to move out. And so they want to know specifically what ideas do I have about changing that, or what do I think that, you know, what is an affordable, how much does an affordable house cost, or, you know, what are my ideas about why exactly th there is this problem, and that that's that's been the big issue in Kahului. Now, of course, in Hana, in Hana, the the you know the big issue uh, has to do with you know property taxes and the rural identity of Hana, and same on Molokai as well. That that was the concerns that they had, you know, in Kihei, it's generally traffic that's that's a big that's been a big issue in Kihei and of course everyone in the in the McKenna area and in the Kihei area has has been very concerned about the Cebu project very concerned and uh, I haven't I haven't talked to anybody yet who's been in, in support of it in, in Kihei but it doesn't mean that there aren't but when you know when we've gone door to door and we've talked to people there uh, 
n no one seems to be uh, in favor of it. And of course, on West, in West Maui, when we go door to door, the people, uh, their main concern has to do, of course, with the bypass, but also uh, they're very concerned that, you know, all of additional development, regardless of whether it's affordable housing or not, is going to uh, strain the poly uh, road into, in, into the other side to the point where people are, you know, you have a heart attack in, in Lahaina and you'll essentially be, you know, sitting watching the whales die on the poly because, I mean, we'll be, you'll die as you watch the whales because you, you know, you, you, you the ambulance can't, can't maneuver around, you know, two hours of, of traffic. And uh, that's been, you know, their big concerns is that people who, you know, the adult children who li live at home with their parents and on the west side, they say they would rather see some improvements in traffic before they get a house because it's so important to them. Well, you're going to so. find that when I talk to you, you're going to have to check back with Lance Collins because I have answers on what to do with those adult children <laughs> and, and how to solve this problem on a short term for the homeowners already. So you watch for that. Um, and I'm not fooling. You know, and a lot of times you can look at the same issue with the same situation, but it's a matter of perception and a better use of resources. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it doesn't have to cost more to solve a problem. Absolutely. A lot of people think you can throw money at a problem uh, or that we need to rely on things that are outside of our ability to control. Yeah. When, in fact, education goes a long way. It does. We may be able to solve the housing problem in the private sector. How's that for a shocker? Yeah, well, that's, that, that, you know, that, 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 that's the only way that it works. I mean, at the, at the minimum, there has to be a private-public partnership, but you know, the, the, the public sector can't solve all of the problems. Right. It just doesn't work that way. And, and uh, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. You can look in Eastern Europe and uh, other places, and, you know, the public sector being in control of everything didn't work. Um, and, it, you know, it doesn't mean that uh, there are ideas there that, that, that didn't work. It just means that the way that it was implemented didn't work. And so you, there has to be, the private sector has to be involved, and the council can't be anti-business. It can't be anti-development. I mean, it, look, it's, it's really simple here. I mean, I'm a small business owner, and a lot of the people that I talk to are small business owners. And, you know, what the, what the county needs is it needs, to foster, it needs to, to foster a local diversified economy. And it's, the council hasn't done a very good job of that. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that we can't start now. It's not too late. Well, I, you know, I'm sure you and I are going to have opportunity to speak more, not only on TV, but privately and share with you. You know, um, there are, it, it's exciting to me to be sitting here with someone who uh, has an opportunity to serve the public and serve me and is open to hearing new and progressive ideas. I think probably the greatest challenge that I see is people get what they think they're going to get. If you think that big developers are going to come in and only build expensive housing and not handle things for the little guy, that's what you get. Right. When in fact, we can find ways to make it more profitable for a developer and not have to build those same right. kind of housing units. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And, uh, that's the kind of thing that I think is really exciting to see in a candidate like yourself. Well, you know, I mean, this is, you know, one, one thing that I've, I've told everyone is that, you know, I don't uh, think that I, I, I know everything. In fact, I don't think that I know very much. I mean, I have a legal training, so I have, I mean, but what the legal training is, it doesn't teach you what the law is. It teaches you a way of thinking and a way of taking in information and trying to sort through it. It's sort of like, a, I guess, like a goldsmith in, in a way. You essentially, the training is not, you don't learn gold, what you, you know, as in terms of how to make it, what you learn first and foremost is, is to test whether something actually is gold or not. And, you know, that's what I think that, uh, you know, my legal training and my graduate uh, research helped me do, is to be able to accept, be open to and accept uh, all ideas and then work through them to figure out which components of them and which elements of them work and don't work, and to be able to take input from everybody and to try to be able to find a solution that at least satisfies all of us and uh, can solve our problems and so we can move on to the net and we can move on to identify the next problem and resolve that. I'm going to bring up, I'm just going to pull something out of the air. I'm sitting here, I'm looking at our monitor and I see these whales. Just so happens it's these whales. <laughs> this is a uh, painting by an artist named Richard Fields who's one of the artists in our association 
we raise money to supplement the development of important technologies toward creation of a self-sustained community model mm -hmm. named Maui. <laughs> okay, so I bring it up. What about the whales and our uh, reefs and such? You know, I, I know that as a local council person, your jurisdiction, if you will, uh, falls into things that are voted here locally. Right. But, you know, sometimes I'm hearing candidates talking about all kinds of subjects. Well, What's your feeling for the interreaction between your ability to work here locally on a county level and interface with the state on all kinds of issues? Well, you know, I know that, that uh, one thing that happens a lot is that you know, the, the council is very limited in what it can do, but, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm sure many of the viewers know about is, you know, the Ahu Pua'a system, which was essentially how Hawaiians uh, understood and operated and, and used land uh, prior to contact um, with uh, Europeans. And the Ahu Pua'a starts up at the top of the mountain and it works its way down to the ocean, but it doesn't stop at the ocean. It actually goes into the ocean. And of course, when, you know, the, when the Kanawai became written down and, and so forth in the 1800s of oh, law. When, when law was written down in the So you know what Ahupua'a means, right? From the top, down like a pie shape, on past the well, edge of the land some of the some, water. some of them are pie shaped. Some of them are pie shaped. Some, okay. some of them look a little bit different, but uh, it, it, it yeah, basically right. a whole ecosystem. A whole ecosystem. From the top into the Ab bottom. Absolutely. And, it, and, it, and that's, you know, each Ahu Pua'a was, and of course an Ahu Pua'a means pig altar, and so that was each Ahu Pua'a was supposed to be differentiated by a pig altar and somewhere on that, you know, so that people understood where it was. But the importance of, of the Ahu Pua'a idea is that, uh, well, you know, the, the county's jurisdiction might be limited, but it actually ends up affecting things that are outside of its jurisdiction. So, you know, when we had the problem with the algae blooms, which I don't think has gone away, no. uh, but when we, you know, when it, when it first started becoming a major issue in the early 90s, it's like, yeah, well, the county doesn't really have control over, over the, the waters, you know, off of Kihei. But it does have control of, over the, all of the farmlands where all of the uh, nitrates were being dropped in. And so it's sort of like, well, yeah, we don't directly, but we indirectly do. And if we have a council that can actually be proactive and try to identify crises before they become crises, then we can resolve them so that doesn't, it, we don't have to wait for you know, the, the fertilizer and stuff to wash into the ocean and, and create you know, this destructive uh, you know, algae blooms. And that's, you know, I think that that's one of the, the most important things for any council, council member is to be able to see into the future and to be able to really think through and, and both think and feel and try to figure out what exactly is the best thing for our county when they're not sure to just say we're not sure and to say why and be open and honest about it. And I think that that is, that is perhaps the most important thing for someone being on our council. Being open and honest and open to receive, like you say. Absolutely. Public testimony and, and uh, having the ability to go to your council person is what we all want, right? Well, you know, I mean, you know, back to back to the procedures of the council. Yeah. You know, th I, the way that it's currently set up, it, it you know has this legislative flair to it, and you know, people are allowed three minutes or a fourth minute to conclude, or an additional three minutes. But, you know, I mean, it's it's very mechanical, and uh, it sort of treats everyone the same. Well, some people have, you know, have more things to say than others, and some people, you know, and it's, and it doesn't take that much more time or energy to be able to really work through and get a very full and comprehensive fact finding from the public. And uh, you know, when the council just says, okay, well, everyone gets three minutes and then you know, enough after that. Well, you know, that, that's not really listening. That's, that's, it, it isn't, it's not active listening. I mean, if you sort of went to your friend and you said, oh, I have this problem about my love life, and your, your friend says, okay, left, you've got two minutes, <laughs> you've been, you've, you know, I mean, that we would be, we would just be horrified. I mean, I, we, right? I mean, it's like, oh, you're not very supportive, and uh, so I think that, that that those 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 things which seem so small or or manini are actually very important in fostering a better community. And I think our council is in a very unique position in our community to be able to do that. I also think that you know it's great that most of the meetings are in Wailuku, but I also think that the council should, you know, try to pull more of its committees out into the community where the decision is actually being made and at times where more people can come because you know when you have all of your meetings at nine in the morning or one in the afternoon you essentially get the one person that can call in sick and then you get a couple of people that are paid to be there and then 
you know then you get a couple of retirees and then that's you know essentially the end of it you know nobody can show up to these nine a m meetings or one a one p m meetings but if you have them after work and in places that people can go to maybe offer some food or whatnot you know we can actually get a community that's heavily involved in the decisions that are being made and that's something that the council can do for it's very inexpensive now and the more community that we get involved now at a smaller cost the less we're going to have to pay out when we have major problems down the line because we didn't get the community input and we didn't get the shared understanding of the problem so well it's very encouraging to talk to you I'm uh, you know many times when I sit with uh, different candidates they have their own passion, and your passion is procedure, and procedure toward a more openness, because as you say, you feel you know very little, or at let's say you're open to knowing a lot more so that more solutions can happen, because the answers are available if we yeah. listen. Well, you know, and I, I, I it's not that I, I don't know a little bit. Oh, I, I really I feel understand. that I, what, I, what, I was, what I meant to say was that uh, that we all understand, we, we all know just a little bit, and together, that's where true understanding comes from. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I have been involved with the council for the last 10 years, so I, I am very knowledgeable on the oh, issues, yeah. and, I, and I, do, I do understand the nuances of it, but at the same time, I'm humbled by the fact that I'm only one person and there are 120,000 people on this island, and uh, just, you know, 1,000 people and having all of their ideas come together and try to form a shared vision, that is much, much more significant than one person or nine people. And you know, the, the Focus Maui Nui, that was 2,000 people, and they, all, they said very clearly what they needed. And that should be, you know, the council doesn't have any policies for its, you know, its legislative program. Well, Focus Maui Nui would be a great start, because 2,000 people in the community came out and said, okay, this is what we want. And so, uh, you know that's that's encouraging, and uh, you know when but when the when the council does things that go against that, it, it's discouraging because it's saying that these nine people somehow have some better understanding about the world than these two thousand. And you know I I I don't believe that. I truly believe that uh, that our community as a whole has the best knowledge and wisdom about how we should deal with our problems. It's just a matter of tapping that resource correctly. You know. Um when Focus Maui Nui come out, there are findings. One of the uh, council people, and she shall be unnamed, Joanne Johnson, <laughs> said to me, Jason, they're thinking like you. The, you know, I really believe that the public is on the pulse of where the problems are and have many of the solutions. Uh, well, you know, absolutely. You live in the problem, you know where it is. And the truth is, is that everyone experiences these problems slightly differently but it's it's sort of like you know the the blind men and the elephant you know one is touching the the trunk and one is touching the you know the the tail and one is touching you know the leg and the foot and all this kind of stuff and they all get this different idea about the what the problem is but if they just come together uh, and be able to talk about what exactly it is then they would understand that it's an elephant and that's sort of how the, you know these, the problem is so big that not no one person can understand all of it and its complexities, and nine people can truly understand it. But together, we can approximate what it is to the point where we can solve it and move on. I'm going to ask you another question that's been close to my heart since I first ran, and since I was aware of it. Um, district voting. It was a while there where people were fighting me, and it was fashionable. When I said district voting, they thought I was some radical green guy. Any thoughts on district voting here in this county? Well, you know, it's a it's a very complicated matter, and I've in other places I've I've said, you know, I don't. Wh one of the strongest arguments against it is that Molokai and Lanai and Hana don't get their own representative, uh, which is, you know, it, that is very important to their community, and that's something that should be preserved. And uh, one way to, you know, there's but there's no reason why we can only need to have nine council members. Just because for the last hundred years we've had a board of supervisors and then a county council that's been composed of you know, seven or nine members doesn't mean that it has to stay at nine. Um, it, it also, can be, isn't it true that even if they don't have their own, what is it about Kahului that makes one draw a line and say this is Kahului? I mean, well, the, the, own issues yeah. and areas overlap? Right, they, they do. And you know, the thing is, is that everyone, you know, the, 
The thing is, is that uh, when you have nine people running for county, uh, the council races are all countywide races. Yeah. What you end up having is nine mayors, essentially. And of course, they all have to live in different areas. And over the years, council members have been able to sort of skate, skate by a little bit and uh, so forth. But, you know, I mean, there's no reason why we can't have more. I mean, you know, 19 people or 12 people or any number. Any number. There's, there's no reason why, you know, there, there only needs to be nine council members. Uh, and so in terms of district voting, well, you know, there's some, some pluses to district voting. If you can have a district that's, you know, small enough to uh, encompass Hana or, or Molokai and, uh, you know, make the appropriate number of districts based on that, then, you know, th the, the, those communities will get their own representative, their true own representative. They, they'll get a representative that they all get to vote for and only they get to vote for and that has to represent them. I know that... Uh, from time to time, the HANA council member has not received the HANA or KNI, uh, you know, Nahiku Kaupo vote. They, it goes to the person that loses, and that sort of kind of happens on a regular basis uh, over the last 20 years. But we could have it in a way where when HANA votes, they get to decide who represents HANA. Uh, and that's, you know, and that's encouraging. And now that we have, you know, three senators and six whole house districts for our own county, it's at least for the next 10 years, it's, it, it's much easier to sort of come up with a way to apportion that correctly. Um, you know, when correctly. you talked about you were walking uh, door to door in Kahului and you're, boy, your feet tired, and I mentioned that here you're walking door to door. In fact, you're inside the door of many, hopefully, thousands and thousands of households on Maui. Absolutely. So that you people can get up close and sit here and in the living room with Lance Collins and realize just how rich an experience this is. I have found this to be really a great pleasure. Um, I know that I can keep talking and we can go on like this. We'd probably do hours like this. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. <laughs> Any other areas that, that if I said, okay, we only have three minutes, uh, you'd want to be sure that you mentioned and deliver a message to the public? Well, you know, uh, you know, I lived in Kihei and then we lived in Wailuku for a while and then, of course, for most of my life, I've uh, lived in Kahului, uh, but you know, in Hana and Haiku, uh, Molokai and Lanai, you know, I, th I th and even in, of course, Kaupo, all of the, the rural areas of Maui, you know, as I've grown up and everything has sort of developed out, it's it's been sad in a way to see, you know, all of our favorite spots disappear, and then with that that book that came out last year or whenever it came out, now there's tourists everywhere. Uh, you know, it, it, that, that's very sad, but one of the things that the general plan and the community, all of the community plans it's at some level speak to is preserving Maui's rural identity. And I think that it's not too late to do that. And I do believe that if enough people on Maui say enough already, and they go out there and then they vote for change for people who want to preserve and protect Maui's rural identity, I think that we still have a chance to save it. And I think that that's so important. If you've lived here, your whole life, you've lived here for two years, or you know, you've lived here for 37 generations. Well, however long you've lived here, we all recognize the beauty of Maui's rural identity. And if we can just hold on to that, it's so important. So that's, that's something that's very close to my heart, is how do we save and how do we protect our natural resources and Maui's rural identity so that our children and our children's children are able to experience it. That's a good thing. I'm going to give you, if I had two minutes, here's my two-minute warning. <laughs> Mass transit. Talk about vision. I remember talking about a monorail system. Um, I laugh. I, our mayor, excuse me, our governor, um, had an opportunity to buy some land and didn't, that now we ended up with a little sliver and we save a little beach. I think we ought to take a look at purchase of land to the future development traffic of a corridors. mass right. transit system, right. traffic corridors, if you will. I lived in Los Angeles, and when I saw all these houses all boarded up for years, and I wondered why, and then I realized they had the vision that they knew they were going to put a highway through, right. and they wanted to buy it when they could buy it for a fraction. I hope that we would consider those kind of things now. Well, you know, all, all over the world, and uh, you know, I haven't traveled everywhere. I've, you know, of course, been to the Philippines because my mother's from the Philippines, and I have a lot of family there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've you know, been to Europe, and uh, I've been to the you know, U.S. continent. And, you know, I, and then, of course, 
Mexico and South America. So, you know, one thing that uh, one thing that that can occur is you know there there are in the middle of these great forests there is a, a train that goes through, <laughs> and for the last 150 years, Maui's had the same thing. Trains are what connected you know the world to each other, and that's definitely one thing that you know needs needs to be looked at because of course we'll never have enough people to get uh, the funding for a bus system, which is sort of unfortunate in a way because. You know, Maui would be well served by a, a well-crafted, uh, you know, bus system. That's that that's obviously not going to happen. But uh, there's there's no reason why we can't rearrange how we develop towns so that first of all, people don't need to have to travel by train except when they need to make you know long-distance traveling. And that's sort of how it works everywhere else in the world, where you have your supermarket, you have your farmers market, you have, you know, your your movie house, and everything is sort of, you know, in the center of this sort of town and then to get from town to town lots of people take you know a train or they take a bus or a jeepney and uh, there's no reason why we can't uh, we can't design our island that way to preserve each town's identity and not have you know traffic jams every morning and every afternoon i mean it's great when we go sign waving because then all you folks get to see us and get to read our signs and so forth but you know i mean the truth is, is that, that uh, there there are so many good reasons to be able to promote people to walk two blocks to the you know the stores so they can buy food every day or you know walk down to the beach and, and not whatnot or walk to work or you know what however they want to get to work without having to drive 50 miles or 30 miles or 25 miles to have to to do that and you know isn't this exciting to sit and hear this kind of an idea you've been hearing it from me now i started the maui arts and music association in 1991 and I had experience at that point. That's already 18 years ago, 19, 17 years <laughs> ago. The idea of Maui as a self-sufficient community where it develops just like you're talking about is not a new idea. Yep. I came back from it's a conference. New. I don't know if you saw my interview on TV with a guy named two people. One was Gunter Pauli, the head of the Zero Emissions Research Institute, and Paolo Lugari, who founded a community in the rural Llanos of uh, Colombia, called mm. Gaviotis, self-sustained community in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. All these ideas that we have are very real, and we can have these solutions here. We need to begin to elect people that employ the visions of the future based on the wisdom of what has already happened in yeah. the past all over the world. Absolutely. You know, sometimes. Just my commentary. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'm like that. What's the guy? O'Reilly. Here we go. <laughs> maybe not exactly. Sometimes it's difficult to remember that your original intention was to drain the swamp <laughs> when you're up to your ass in alligators. <laughs> when you jump on the council, you have grand visions, but you're so busy looking at the day to day, what yeah. are you going to do with all these problems, that you don't have the opportunity to stick with your vision. I hope that we can elect the kind of people it takes five it takes five people five. it takes five people on the council to get things done so if you vote for me because you want you know there to be change you should you know make sure that you have some education on some of the other candidates and try to figure out which five or which six can get the job done the best yeah it's very important because if you're in with the alligators you know <laughs> There, yep. uh, you essentially, you know, become a, a, a lone dissenting voice or something like that, which is helpful when we look back in history and figure out what went wrong, because we get the one dissenting voice that's the persecuted martyr. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be that way anymore on Maui. We can actually have a council that does good for our community. Well, I want you to, uh, once again, with me, Thank Lance Collins for being brave enough to sit here with me. I don't think it's that brave. You don't really need bravery. I'm not really a guy with a sword. I'm here to really share with you someone who's had the, um, I would say, I was going to say, who lost his mind, who went out for public office. But the fact is, there's a certain heart that comes from every candidate who says, I want to serve the public. You know, one of the council people mentioned to me, that Lance Collins could go out and be a successful attorney, but he has decided he would like to be involved in our county government. I hope that you'll give very careful consideration all over Maui County, because you can all vote, for Mr. Lance Collins. Lance, thank you for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure it's being here. Pleasure. Thank you. So we hope that you'll join us again, and uh, I hope you have a great day.
Aloha. Aloha.